And we're back. The Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast for Super Bowl week. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And John, a jam-packed show. The big get, Al Michaels, we already recorded it. We asked him all the questions about Amazon, ESPN, what he's thinking about, what's next. And we got into the big game uh, that's coming up that he's going to call his 11th Super Bowl tying Pat Summerall for the most on TV. Getting Al Michaels during Super Bowl week, that's truly a big get. But my big takeaway from that interview, he's going to, to Amazon. He didn't come right out and say he's going to Amazon, but I feel like that's exa- that's totally where he's going. I mean, I've been there in the 90 percentile, but I'm still I don't know. ESPN can make a run. I think it'd be it's very important if they were able to get someone like Trey Aikman or somebody he wants to work with. I think that could be maybe a difference maker for ESPN. Uh, but as always with Al, it's going to be interesting. We also asked about Oswald the Rabbit last time we had one of these uh, things with Al uh, and where he might go. By the way, stay tuned for his Howard Cosell story. That's that's worth it. That is a teaser. All right. The topics besides Al, of course, we're going to go who's up, who's down in a moment. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into the Super Bowl, the Olympics, the ratings, to Rico, the executive moves uh, reported the other day. Jimmy Pataro, new contracts, going to be back for three and a half more years. Jeff Zucker's out at Turner. What does that mean? Netflix going into sports. That's very interesting. Uh, Cubs possibly streaming. Uh, and then we'll have our calls of the week. So let's start who's up and who's down. Who's up? Who's down? I'll start us off here. Who's up? I've got Lenny Daniels of Turner. Look, after Jeff Zucker was forced to resign, I started reporting a standard what's next story. I do it every time somebody big leaves. Who's going to replace Zucker atop Turner Sports? It's always a popular story to write. Um, But a funny thing happened when I started reporting this story this time with Zucker out, only one name consistently kept coming up, and that was Lenny Daniels. Lenny Daniels, he spent more than 25 years at Turner. The last eight, he's been the president of Turner Sports. Nobody knows what David Zaslov's going to do. He uh, runs Discovery, and they're getting ready to take over Warner Media. But if, if he's looking to make a big splash, Maybe maybe uh, Lenny Daniels is out, but the betting here is that he's going to stick with Lenny Daniels. Okay, my who's up is Mina Kimes. We're coming here to the end of football season. And what Mina Kimes has done is basically something no one has ever done before, male or female. A person who wasn't a reporter, isn't a hot taker, isn't an insider, wasn't in the front office, didn't play. She's become an analyst and a very good analyst at that uh, big story on her, a big feature uh, with a lot of details on her. And it's just very impressive. And what really impresses me the most with really people who uh, do TV, I just think, and I wrote this, she gets in and out um, like Cooper Cup of her routes. She, she, she does her, she has her topic statement. She has her three sentences or four sentences to back it up with really good detailed uh, using analytics a lot of times. And she, to me, is who's up, stocks rising. And some people even mentioned maybe she ends up in a front office one day. You think that's going to happen? Uh, I'm not sure. She doesn't think she's um, qualified right now. Which I thought was very interesting. She said right now, uh, Jeff Saturday, former uh, Peyton Manning center, all pro uh, center. He thought so. A bunch of other people said that to me. It wasn't really in my thinking when I started the story. But when you look at it, she went to Yale, Ivy League. We have seen that trend of Ivy League grads or, or you know, not, even, not only Ivy League, but college grad never played uh, being in front office, especially in baseball. We're starting to see that more in other sports as well. Uh, so I don't think it's out of the question. I don't think it's happening tomorrow. But I could see it. I, she's just really intelligent. I learned a lot about her. Worked uh, really hard on that story. So hopefully you can get a chance to read that uh, as well. All right. Who's down? You go first, John. All right. Who's down? I'm going to go deep into the executive ranks for my who's down, Andrew. I got Dan Masonson of NBC. Uh, we all like Mace. Mace is great. We like Mace and he's great at his job. But he is the VP of communications for NBC Sports. And he has... For the next two weeks, the most thankless job in sports media. And that's because TV ratings for the Winter Olympics are abysmal. They're down close to 50% on TV ratings. And it's Mace's job 
to spin those ratings and tell us exactly why they aren't actually down 50%. So we're hearing a lot about Peacock streaming numbers. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, comparisons to last year during February when there was no Olympics uh, going on. Uh, we like Mace a lot, but uh, sorry, Dan, this time you're a who's down for the Marsh and Oran Sports Media Podcast. Yeah, Mace in your face. I always say this, uh, when I worked in radio, the longer the email, the worse the ratings, right? That's kind of the, <laughs> so the more they have to figure out, if they can't just say it, it usually means it's not good news. Uh, but the overall story, it's obviously an NBC story uh, in terms of Olympics. We talked about it last week. This is a get the Cincinnati uh, Belichick line uh, Olympics for them. Get the Paris and the next Olympics, which is the Summer Olympics, uh, and get past this one. Tariq will come home early. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. All right, so who's your who's down? Yeah, my who's down is an obvious one for sports uh, and news. Jeff Zucker uh, was leading Turner Sports. Uh, you mentioned Lenny Daniels, uh, likely to replace him uh, or is already replacing him. Uh, look, Zucker was going to be super important going forward because as you've we've talked about, Warner Media and Discovery with their merger are going to be going strong. David Zavlov likes to spend money, is, is, is eager to spend money on sports, make big bets. Zucker was going to be the one making those decisions. Now he's out. So he's obviously on the way down and out. So uh, to me, that's an obvious one. And uh, I'll take that easy one instead of trying to be too creative. Uh, Mason, your face. Mason, oh, Dan Masonson. Let's, let's, just go, let's just go all time. Let's go PR people. You know, we'll hit everybody. We'll They're always Curry, down, Curry, aren't Curtis, they? Curtis, Waka, <laughs> let them all. Sabatel. A little bit every single week. Those are all for those who don't know. Those are all PR people for all the networks, and they love to say how great every story is that we have. There's no, there's no such thing as bad press, Dan. Let's go to the topic. Start with the Super Bowl. We'll have Al Michaels in a in a, in a little bit uh, with some great stories, and it'll get go deeper into Amazon and ESPN what he's thinking. Uh, but let's go first off the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, the big thing with the Super Bowl is always the ratings, John. What do you see? I'm going to put the over under. Over under. I mean, we're, we, we, I think we're both over a, a hundred, uh, a hundred million, right? Is that your Mike Francesa? I think, I can't, I can't I, I'm, I'm from DC. I've never heard the guy. Yeah, I, don't exactly. know so I, I'm the only, I can't do any person. I think I can do Francesa over under and then dog. <laughs> All right. a hundred million. What do you got over or under? Oh, I think it's certainly going over a hundred million. I'm putting the over underline at 103 million. 103. All right. You know what? Oh, you're putting that at the over under. Oh, wow. So you're going to challenge me there. Okay. Um, I'm going to go slightly over. I think the NFL ratings have been through the roof. I think this will be another indication of that. Um, I don't think it matters who the teams are. Uh, you don't have the big name teams, but I just think it's a, people want to get together some, if they can, if it's, you know, okay with COVID where they are. Um, and I, I think it'll be a celebration a little bit. And I think, uh, they will get the over 103 million. What do you got over under? I have over as well. I have the LA market. I know they haven't taken to the Rams. It's not a big sports market, but it still is the second biggest TV market. They're not only hosting the game, but they have a team in the game. The rating in LA is going to be huge. And then on the Cincinnati sideline, yeah, I, I have a, a focus group of one. My daughter came home and said, who is this Joe Burrow? Everybody at school is talking about him. So here in D.C., Joe Burrow seems to be breaking through as a potential star. Yeah, that's why John Oren is so good. That That's a great point, I think, especially about the L.A. and how big that number will be. Normally, you get a good number in L.A., but not a great number. But you're right. That's a huge second market, of course, uh, after New York. All right. Are you quickly? Are you a pregame watcher? Do you watch? Will you get are you at two o'clock in the afternoon, four and a half hours of pregame shows or no? it'll be on in the background, but boy, that, that's, that is hard to commit, commit to. Are you a pregame watcher? I'd like to watch a lot of, I, it's terrible. I love to just see what they come up with. Uh, you know, they're not as creative as I don't think as they once were. Um, but, uh, but Mike Tirico will host that. He's hosting the Olympics, moves us into topic two. Came home early from the Olympics. Uh, Tirico's hosting. You got Maria Taylor involved as well. Um, when you look at let's the Olympics, okay, what, how do you describe what's going on with NBC? Uh, we talked about it early with the, you know, um, who's down. Uh, how do you spin it? You, you know, and actually, by the way, last week, you said there could be some good news for NBC, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken. I might have to replay that. Here you go, Dan Masonson again. There's a way to spin these ratings numbers, which are the lowest in winter Olympic history, the lowest in Olympic history, obviously. 
where they're they're still winning the night. They knew that this was going to be a really bad games from a rating standpoint. They're looking forward to to Paris uh, coming up, and that's that's where they're going to start to break out. And they just sort of need to maintain it. They're still winning the night. It, it is what it is. They knew it was going to be bad. It's I think it's probably lower than I was expecting, and my uh, expectations were pretty low. Uh, but I, I don't think it's it's deadly for them. And you, you know, Peacock, um, they've tried to make the streaming easier. I think that's been a little bit better when I've checked it out. Um, and then also hitting on China, we talked about this as well. Uh, they did address it pretty well for the Olympic network that, you know, working with the Olympic committee, I, I think they've addressed that pretty well. And so um, I don't think we can really hit them on that. I think they've done pretty well in terms of, um, you know, people don't want to watch it the whole time anyways, but I think they've um, addressed it enough where I think they've more than satisfied in terms of if you're feeling like, well, will NBC ignore everything? Uh, they're certainly not ignoring everything. The way NBC used to do it, they used to you know address what happened over in Russia, for example, between 7 and 7.30 on the first night of the Olympics. So, so nobody would actually see it, but they could always point to that and say, look, we already addressed it. Uh, but th th they're, they're addressing it during the competition now, during times when, when people are hearing it. Probably not enough for some people, but uh, certainly more than they used to and more than I was expecting them to. Yeah, you can't satisfy everybody, um, you know, especially with the uh, Olympics and the politics and, and where we are, of course. All right. Topic three, executive moves. Um, Jimmy Pataro, new with three and a half year contract. Zeph Zucker out at Turner Sports. All right, let's start with Pataro. Your feeling, uh, what it says that Disney is entrusting him with uh, ESPN for the next three and a half years as the uh, as the man in charge. The big news would have been if he if he didn't get uh, re re renew his, his contract. Thanks for making yeah. my story. You know, not that you know, like, hey, it's a really <laughs> it was, good story. Fine, it's a story. <laughs> I wanted that story. I did. I heard from Abe Madcor uh, at like six thirty this morning saying, "Why didn't we have that story?" So thanks a lot, Andrew. Thanks. Exactly. Good job, uh, Abe. Disney executives, ESPN executives, they signed three year deals, and so uh, Jimmy Pataro came in three years ago. And it's hard to believe that, you know, John Skipper was there just a little more than three years ago. And the differences between ESPN then and ESPN now are stark. He has completely repaired an NFL relationship that, that, that went haywire. Look, the entire cable system, the entire sports programming system is dealing with cord cutting. Uh, and it, it's a distressed business. And he's still riding it. Uh, he's still riding that business. It's still a good business for ESPN. And he's trying to, to, to do the transition uh, into, into streaming. And it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one to do. He's doing it as well as anybody right now. All right. And the biggest challenge for Jimmy Pitaro going forward is what? To figure out what's been a constant debate on this podcast, which is when to solely, fully go to streaming versus uh, versus taking care of their linear network. Okay, I told you 2024, 20, 25, put that in the book. Uh, that's what I'm saying. All right, uh, Zucker, uh, you say Lanny Daniels is gonna get it. Any uh, any chance somebody else from the outside, they, they go with a different person, uh, and, you know, leading that shop? David Zaslov grew up with Jeff Zucker in the business. I mean, they, they, they worked together in the uh, at NBC in the 1990s. He grew up with Dick Ebersaw, in the business, also at NBC in the 1990s. When uh, when David Zaslav looks at sports, he looks for like superstar executives. He thinks like that, that that's what he surrounded himself with. You know, if that's the route that he wants to take, you know, will Lenny fit into that route? I, I'm not certain about this. I do know this, the uh, Lenny has the total support of Turner Sports and people that work at Tur Turner Sports. And he has a fantastic reputation with the NBA, with the MLB, with the NCAA, uh, uh, and with hockey, I assume uh, as well. So he's a he's a very safe choice in order to move forward. The only thing that could get in that way is if like D David Zaslav has stars in his eyes. We move to Netflix. Uh, next topic: Netflix getting into sports. John, what do you know about that? There's an influential media analyst, Laura Martin of Needham. And she is not big on, on Netflix right now. She thinks Netflix needs to change its strategy. She thinks Netflix needs to add an advertising tier. She thinks Netflix needs to make a big purchase to get a big library of content to get out there. And interestingly enough, she thinks Netflix needs to look into live programming, which would mean sports and news. And so if Netflix makes that move, 
which would be a huge 180 to how they they viewed the market uh, as of now. Look for the NBA. I, I think I think if there are digital companies that are really big in terms of uh, uh, of moving into sports, the NBA and the NBA deal, which comes up in 2024, is going to be the one to look at. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, because if you're going to go, you got to go big probably, and that does make some sense. It costs a lot of money. Um, the question is, is there a cap in terms of how many people and how many streaming uh, networks they're going to have? But I do think as this becomes more of to the forefront of people's minds and they're thinking about, I have Disney Plus and Hulu and Netflix and HBO Max, et cetera, et cetera. They're starting to make decisions. And I have friends who aren't in the business who go from one, you know, like go get Apple for Ted Lasso, cut it. Go get uh, Peacock and watch Yellowstone, cut it and move around. And so sports gives you that long tail, like Peacock, when you look what they did with Premier League, um, or if you look what, uh, you know, what, what ESPN has done with a variety of sports, you have that long tail because Premier League goes for eight, nine, 10 months of the year. So you're not going to, if you like Premier League, you basically have, you're going to have the service the whole year. And that's, that's a guarantee that you don't have if you're trying to put, even if you're Amazon putting $500 million into uh, a new Lord of the Rings series, you don't know that's going to work. Sports. You don't know how well it's going to work on streaming, but you know you're going to get at least some people. And, you know, and and, ho- and for them, hopefully, all the people who were watching. That's the question we have, of course, about the young people. Well, are they interested in watching all these games? Yeah, we're still several years away from this from that happening. Right now, today in 2022, I, I got to believe that Turner and ESPN are going to renew the NBA. I think it's that important to to both those companies. However, it's within the uh, the NBA's DNA to sort of do these out of the box deals. Remember they were the first one to go all in with cable. And when, when they uh, left NBC to go, to go to ESPN, they have a younger fan base that would be more prone to streaming as well. So they're, they're the ones that I'm really looking at. And they're, you know, I know the big 10 is up and MLS is out there, but they're the next really big one uh, from a national standpoint that's gonna be uh, coming up. Let's go to our final topic, Cub streaming. Uh, Sinclair and the Cubs talking about a streaming network, New York Post business section. I had that story the other day. It's been out there. We've talked about this as well. Um, John, your take on the Cubs maybe going rogue uh, in this situation and maybe doing a deal without the blessing of MLB. MLB and Sinclair, of course, we talked about it. Your buddy, the head of Sinclair, Chris Ripley, who's been who's down perennial champion. Him and Rob Manfred, the commissioner of MLB, have not seen eye to eye. What says you about this? Well, what's even more important than going rogue on MLB is are they going to go rogue on Comcast? Are they going to try to, to cut Comcast in? Because right now they make most of their money from Comcast and from DirecTV. And so if they all of a sudden decide that they're gonna launch their own streaming service and the streaming service ends up help, uh, increasing cord cutting in the Chicago market for Comcast and for DirecTV, then there's gonna be a lot of pain from DirecTV and Comcast where they either tear that channel, they drop the channel. It's not, it's not a fait accompli. The, the distributors still hold a lot of leverage because they still pay a lot of money for those channels. All right, John, joining us now, the big get, Al Michaels. He's going to do his 11th Super Bowl on TV, tying Pat Summerall for the all-time record this Sunday. He's been honored by the Football and Baseball Hall of Fame. Do you believe in miracles? He's been in some movies. He's done it all. Marshan and Orient Sports Media Podcast. Al, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, guys. I just hope the ratings don't tank now that I'm on. <laughs> we'll see. We'll, well see. Al, Al, my first question was about ratings. Uh, you know, take a, you're going to do a broadcast that's going to probably get over 100 million viewers. Do you get nervous? I'd be terrified. You know, in a way, it's not nervous. I'm anxious. and I wish the game was tonight, frankly, because it's a long buildup, two weeks. This is day eight as we take this right now. Um, there's an anxiousness, not a nervousness. And one way I think I calmed myself down a number of years ago was somebody said, 100 million people are going to watch the game. Aren't you nervous? And I thought to myself, we live in a country of 330 million people. This also means 230 million people don't care and are not watching the game. So that's one way to put it in perspective. Well, 100 million people means that there are a lot of people 
that are very casual fans and maybe not even fans at all. How does it, how does that affect how you call the game? Well, you try to strike a balance. Um, if you're getting deep into something that, you know, the football fan knows, you may approach it a little bit differently so that it's more understandable to the people who don't watch a lot of football. But then again, you never want to insult the people who do watch a ton of football. And obviously we know there are tens of millions of those. So it's a little bit of a balancing act where, you know, if you want to go, as I say, a little deeper, kind of bring it back so that the, the, the casual fan, the fan only watches a couple of games during the season and the big games in postseason understands it. But uh, we've been doing this for a, a lot of years. And, and I think, uh, I think we've got whatever the template is. I think we've got it down. 11 Super Bowls is incredible. Uh, Al, do, do you have a favorite two or three calls that, that, that you, from that, uh, from those 11? Well, of the 10 prior ones, John, uh, six of them, including the last four have gone either down to the last play or the last several seconds. So we're hoping that that, that run continues on, on Sunday. Uh, I would say if I had to pick one favorite telecast and Super Bowl, 2008, Arizona, what are they doing in there against Pittsburgh? But they go on a magical run and Larry Fitzgerald's having a postseason for the ages. Kurt Warner is the quarterback against the vaunted Pittsburgh Steelers who were, who were favored in the game. And I know Dick Ebersole was the uh, head of NBC Sports at the time, and he was apoplectic when Arizona got in. He says, oh, my God, you know, who's going to watch the game? I said, Dick, does any – I mean, can, can you see a couple coming down to a breakfast table on the morning of the Super Bowl? And the husband says, Zelda, the Arizona Cardinals are in the Super Bowl. Let's go to the movies. So I had to calm Dick down on, on that level. It turned out to be – an unbelievably highly rated game. I think the highest Super Bowl rating at that point ever. It, the game was phenomenal. Uh, James Harrison, a hundred yard run back at the end of the half. You've got uh, Roethlisberger leading that charge at the end, the catch by Santonio Holmes. Larry Fitzgerald giving Arizona the lead with two and a half minutes to play. The game was fantastic. And I thought John Madden, who I was ending my seventh year with, had as great a game as he's ever had. And I walked out of that booth and there was a major afterglow. There was a great feeling. The crew was great. We had all the shots that we needed. And we walked downstairs and, you know, go out to the parking lot where the, where the trucks are. I've never had a, a better feeling after a telecast than that. And of all things, three months later, what happens out of nowhere? I was shocked. John retires. And uh, John just felt, uh, and John was a man who, who could very concisely sum things up uh, very quickly and, and right to the point. He said, it's time. And so John Madden, when you think about all the great things he did, he went out and, and as great as he ever was in the game that was my favorite game to televise. First off, John, let me point out, when you said 11 years to, to, uh, to Al, just classic Michaels making his partner look better there by saying, in the 10 I've done, very slyly. I don't know if the audience <laughs> noticed that when you, when you slipped up and said that he's already done 11. So notice that, Al. We you, all you need an to... editor in our life, Andrew. Yeah, exactly. There you go. But it was subtle. It was subtle. Sorry for pointing it out, John. That was my bad, but not as good a partner as that would be. Um, you mentioned, John. Now, you've said before, let's get to the good stuff. You've said that you don't want to retire. Uh, we, we understand that. You're still, uh, you know, I've written a number of times, still throwing 90, 95, um, hitting the black a lot. Um, just what are the circumstances? Why do you want to continue? What, what's the reasoning for, you know, this obviously could be a swan song for you in L.A., hometown, Super Bowl. It could be. Uh, but you want to continue. What, what's the reasoning behind that? Andrew, I feel that I, I love what I do. I mean, I'm a kid who grew up in Brooklyn. My father took me to a Dodger game uh, when I was six or seven years old. This is all they ever wanted to do. And my dreams have come true tenfold. Uh, gotten to do all the Olympics that I always wanted to do as a kid. World Series, did eight of them. Though it seems like somebody else did those because none since 1995. Super Bowl never existed. And then to get to this point, I just love it. I, I love the people that I've worked with for a long, long time. There's a buzz. Uh, there's an excitement. Uh, I still get a kick out of going to the games and getting there early and the crowd fills in and the music is going. Uh, I'm still excited by it. And I'm, I'm a sports fan at heart and always have been. And I have always loved sports and it hasn't waned. 
And I'll never forget when I did, I did the World Series of 1972 with the Cincinnati Reds. And I was on with Kurt Gowdy. And I loved Kurt. He was my first idol. And I, uh, he said to me, you know, kid, you're going to have a great career. Just remember one thing, don't get jaded. And I thought to myself, get jaded? How can I get jaded? I love this. But those words still ring in, in my ear because I can see where in, in this business, some of the, the people that have worked in the business do get jaded and they get bored or whatever. They're tired of the traveling. This has never happened to me. I love it. I love it as much as I've ever loved it. So thank God I'm blessed with good health. I feel great. I think the brain is still working fine. And uh, I have opportunities to, to continue on. And I want to do it because when people say retire, I'm going, retire to what? They say, you know, oh, you can play more golf. I say, I play enough golf. I don't have to do that. I love what I do. And I hope to be able to continue next year. Now, I've reported Amazon is kind of has you at the top of their list. ESPN uh, has considered making a run at you. Uh, and I know you're going to make a decision and, and really get into it after the Super Bowl. But when you think about this, what you want, when you look for you know, where you're going next, what is it that you want? 77 have accomplished everything uh, in, in your career. What is that you want in terms of when you look at your next place? You know, and I think there could be a, a, a spot where you're working with NBC, some uh, with Amazon. But what, what are you looking for? As usual, John, Andrew is totally wired. You know that, right? Totally. <laughs> but when Andrew calls me, I said, what's new in my life, by the way? <laughs> Sometimes he has scoops for me. I think, Andrew, I think that I've got to have a team. This, this, I'm, you're out there and you're kind of a centerpiece in a way because people know you and they see you. But I think, you know, in this business, uh, you need a, a great producer, director, and a partner. You've got to be able to work with somebody who you can feel very comfortable with and trust and not only get along with, but just there's, there's a, you know, I've always said the, the, the game is the melody and then the announcers provide the lyrics. So you got to make sure if you're in a, you know, a duet or a band or whatever, that everybody is, 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 is playing the same tune. So when I look to the future, I mean, that's going to be a big part of the decision making process. And what's going to happen? Because I'm not, you're not out there on an island. You're just not. And, and you may be, as I say, you're front and center in a way, but you need a lot of support people with you, a lot of people behind you, a lot of people who know exactly where you're going and you're going with them. And I think that's going to be as important as anything right now moving forward. Now, when you look at NBC, when they brought in Mike Tirico, you know, the, the feeling was then that he would succeed uh, Bob Costas on the Olympics and then uh, and then you, you're on play by play. Bob obviously chose to end his Olympics um, hosting duties. Uh, you've gone, I think, maybe longer than maybe Mike anticipated. Um, and so uh, how has that gone for you in terms of with NBC and how everything's transpired in terms of uh, what we haven't seen behind the scenes? Yeah, well, maybe longer than uh, some other people anticipated as well. And, and I know maybe <laughs> somebody told me, he said, I've outkicked the coverage. Maybe. I don't know. But what do I know right now? All I know is I feel great. and I want to continue to do this. I think when we brought Mike over, what NBC's plan was in 2016 was to have Sunday Night Football and Thursday Night Football because CBS, I think, had the original Thursday Night package and then CBS and NBC were going to split it in 16 and 17. And NBC's plan was to get it all in 18. So what happened? Uh, in 16, we brought Mike over. Uh, our people were under the assumption that Mike was going to do Thursday, but the league said, no, no, we made the deal with you guys. We want the Sunday night crew. So Chris and I had to do the, uh, that part of the package in 16. Where we did double duty. In 17, Mike was able to come in. In 18, now you've got Fox that comes in, and they get the rights to this, and then there's no Thursday night. So, you know, Mike, has spent a lot of time in the bullpen. And the, the irony is too here that, you know, I did 20 years of Monday night and Mike did the next 10. So it's not like, you know, Mike doesn't have any experience doing primetime football. Anyway, that's kind of how the involvement of this thing has gone. And, and as I say, maybe there's an outkicking of the coverage component here, but what can I tell you? How important is the quality of the games that you're going to be doing? I mean, you're doing the Super Bowl right now. And one of the fears that I would have if I was you is going to Amazon, you'd be doing a lot of 
Commanders and Jaguars games. <laughs> Commanders against the Jaguars are separately. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. But, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you, you get a game, you go, wow, you know, it's two great teams. It's going to be fabulous. And the game turns out to be a dog. And other times you wind up with a game that doesn't look very good. And, and you go back over the Thursday night games on Fox this year. There were a couple of matchups that went, no, oh, that's not very good. And the game has turned out to be great. So, you know, once you get on the air, you you just forget about what the matchup is and you do the game. So, yes, I don't think there's any question, but that on Thursday night, it can't be as, as uh, quality driven, let's say, as a Sunday or Monday where teams can make multiple appearances. On Thursday night, teams can only make as of right now, one appearance per year. So it's a different kind of animal, but uh, I would think it, with the amount of money that Amazon is going to pump into the National Football League, I think the league will do their best to give them as many good games on Thursday night as possible. Now, Al, I'm, I'm Irish Catholic, so like my grudges hold grudges. Like when, when you left ESPN, you know, it, it, it was you know, rather unceremonious. Uh, Fred uh, what was sort of kicked over to, to NBC. You and John sort of uh, uh, what went out that way. Do you still hold a grudge? I know those executives aren't there anymore, but the, the, the brand is. No, you know, what happened was we were all under the Disney umbrella and I was at ABC and I'd been there for 30 years. And now ESPN comes along and they're the upstart. And of course they become the worldwide leader. And then what happened was when the new contracts came into effect in the 06 season, they thought at Disney that the best position to put Monday night football in would be ESPN. So I was you know, completing my 20th year. We had a lame duck year in 05. Dick Ebersole came right after John Madden, right after him immediately got John. He always wanted to have John. Uh, the season progresses and and, and Dick is able to get Fred Gadelli and Drew Essekoff, ESPN. Yeah, ESPN wanted, you know, they, they wanted their people in there. There was this whole, you know, kind of thing about, hey, you know, we're taking over and the ABC guys are the outlier. Now it's our show. So I, I, got, I got caught in the middle of that. I didn't want to have to do Monday night on ESPN. I couldn't make a deal with Ebersole after he'd gotten Gadelli and Essekoff. Now he's got Madden, Gadelli and Essekoff. And I've got to go over there because that's the, those are where my guys are. And um, I, we had to, um, I went to them. I went, I, I don't hold any grudges because I, I went to the folks at Disney and I said, look, I said, I'd appreciate it if you let me out of my deal because it's better for both of us. You've got certain ideas about how you want to do Monday Night Football beginning in 06. They don't really blend with my ideas. You know, my people are all over at the other place. So we affected a, uh, we, we arranged a deal where ESPN and Disney got uh, certain rights to Ryder Cup events and more Olympic coverage and all that. And then, of course, at the end of the day, we threw in that lucky rabbit, Oswald, who became the star of the show at that point. So to this <laughs> day, what can I tell you? I've got all these. Uh, the headline posters, writes itself out. Post posters and, and, and rag dolls. Uh, with, with the little Oswald, who, who looked well, exactly yeah. like Mickey Mouse. I actually have, I, I wish I had it with me. I'm in LA already for the Super Bowl. I have an Oswald the uh, rabbit shirt and our dog is named Oswald after Oswald the rabbit because my kids love Disney. That's more the reason, that's how we tied that in. But, um, but here's my thing. How do you feel about that, that Oswald the rabbit part of it? Because that has become a part of sports casting lore. Love it. I mean, it, it, it's in, in a way, Part of the thing, look, the deal was done. It was done before Oswald. And then I got a call from a top executive at Disney. You ever hear of Oswald, the lucky rabbit? No. Well, the Disney family, the Disney heirs want to get him back with us. So I go, yeah, so? Well, what if we threw Oswald into this deal? I go, fine. So, of course, naturally, otherwise it would look like some sort of an insidious thing was going on behind the scenes. I was breaking a contract whatever. So instead of it looking like something that was untoward, Oswald became the joke. And, and, and Andrew, you also know, you brought up the fact that, that, you know, Oswald looked like Mickey Mouse. So the biggest joke was played by Walt Disney when he was told he couldn't take Mickey, he, Oswald with him. 
and then he made a mouse. He made a mouse look like a rabbit. I mean, think about that. You put the two of them together, they came out of the same room, I'm telling you. It looks exactly the same. The question is, would uh, Disney World have been as successful in Disney overall if it was Oswald the Rabbit instead of Mickey Mouse? Great question. I, I know I, no, nobody can answer that, but that you know, would a rabbit have superseded a mouse or a mouse superseded? I don't know. That's a question for the Asians, though. Exactly. A couple of quick hitters as we get to as we finish up here. Just we have you on. Got to ask what your best Cosell story. If, you, if somebody you're at a party, someone says uh, Howard Cosell, Al, what's your best story? What can you tell us on a pop podcast that's listened around the world? Well, I mean, the the classic Cosell story is we're in Kansas City. We're doing a baseball game just before the strike in in '81. The Yankees are coming to town, and I get to town on Sunday night. And Howard calls my room and he says, Al Falfa, a, line, a name he stole from Bob Euchre. Euchre gave me that name. What are you doing? Nothing. Meet me in the lobby at six o'clock. We're going to dinner at the Savoy Grill. Okay. We have, and, and in those years, you had the longest limousine in town belonged to ABC. So it's a long white limousine driven by a woman by the name of Peggy, who had been driving all of the ABC people for 30 years. We go downtown. Howard drinks an aquarium's worth of vodka. And also when Howard was on the road, he'd always have the yellow blazer. He's got the toupee, of course, and a cigar. So, and Howard loved being noticed. And he's sitting in the Savoy Grill and everybody's coming over. We, we finish up and we get into the limousine and now we're going through Kansas City, uh, an area just uh, off, off downtown. Uh, it's dusk. And then we come to a stoplight and Howard looks off to his, he's sitting left in, in the back, left seat. And he looks across the, the street and there are two kids having a, a fight, a serious fight. And five or six other kids are, you know, egging them on. Next thing you know, Howard opens the door and gets out onto the street and starts to walk toward them. And Peggy screams, Mr. Tosamas. Meanwhile, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grab him. I can't. He's already gone. He's on the sidewalk. And at that point, no cell phones. Can't call a cop. You can't. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen here. I've got two young kids, so I'm, I can't save him. And Peggy's dying in the front. So meanwhile, the, the fight stops. You've got six or seven kids who just have their mouths open. And they, it just stops. It's, it's suspended animation. And, and then how, how it says, OK, OK, listen up. It's quite apparent to this trained observer that the young Southpaw does not have a jab requisite for the continuation of this fray. Furthermore, his opponent is a man of inferior and diminishing skills. This confrontation is halted post haste. So I'm in the car, Peggy is going crazy. And meanwhile, thank God, now you got the moment of truth. Are they gonna jump him or they know who he is? Howard Cosell, Howard Cosell. They start dancing around him like he's a maypole. Somehow a, a writing utensil gets produced. He signs a couple of autographs on their shirt, comes back into the limousine. Okay. I'm thinking, can you imagine these kids going back and trying to explain it to the people that they live with? So the limousine takes off. It was so crazy that I was speechless. Peggy was speechless. She drives away. She drives about two blocks. We come to a, a stop sign. Peggy looks into the rear view mirror and says to Howard, uh, Mr. Cosell, excuse me, I've, I've been driving for 30 years. I've seen everything. I've never seen anything like that. And Howard leans back. He's got the cigar going, takes a drag and says, Pegaroo, just remember one thing. I know who I am. <laughs> and, then we, and that is, I can't do any better than that with Cosell. I've got a few stories, but that takes the cake. That's amazing. Just give us the Al Gore story, if you can, like a, a quick version of the Al Gore story with the phone, if you can. Well, Christmas 2000. So uh, I'm in uh, Tennessee. We're in Nashville doing uh, the Titans against the Cowboys. This is post-election. Meanwhile, you got the hanging chairs out there. Who won the election? It's Bush against Gore. And I'm, I'm having a problem with my phone in the, in the room on the top floor of the Lowe's Hotel uh, across from Vanderbilt. The guy comes up there, oh, you know, we've had all kinds of trouble since Gore was here on, on election night. They took over the whole top floor, screwed up the phone system. Okay. So I'm thinking, well, Gore was down the hall, probably. The big suite belonged to Bud Adams, then the, the owner of the, uh, the Titans. 
And I, uh, so I, we come back from dinner, it's Christmas Eve. And uh, I see that the door to the suite is open. So I knew Bud and I was gonna go and hey, you know, uh, Bud, your door is open, Merry Christmas, whatever. So nobody's in there. So I'm, I, I walk in and uh, I see a, there's a phone on the coffee table. And I'm thinking, they probably had secure phones, but maybe, maybe this was the phone that Gore used to concede to Bush before, you know, everything went crazy afterwards with the hanging chads. So I just unplugged it and I took it. So I'm a kleptomaniac. <laughs> I wouldn't, I'm a junior kleptomaniac, but I had to have that in some way, somewhere in, in the in the garage. Listen, Al, good luck this Sunday. Uh, Super Bowl on TV number 11. Good luck after trying to figure out your future. If it's Amazon, if it's ESPN, listen, I'm, I don't want to speak for John. If those don't work out, it could be Marshant, Oran, and Michaels. We have a spot. Media podcast. I know Absolutely. you may want top billing. We'll have to discuss that. But if it doesn't work out with anybody else, you, you could have, you could talk media every week. Andrew, you'll be the guy to call me to tell me what my next move is. I'm counting on it. Let's hope for you. <laughs> it's not with Marshant and Oran. That, would not be, <laughs> that means it didn't work out well. You're this is fun. A lot of fun. Great Thanks, guys. Al. John, Al was tremendous. And you know what? I actually have a similar story in that 2000 year with Al Gore uh, staying in a suite. I covered the Mets back then for the post. I was the schlub sports writer. But I did have a lot of Marriott points. So you get status. The Mets were staying at the Vinoy the Renaissance in St. Petersburg. They're playing the Rays. So all the Mets are there. Bobby Valentine, Mike Piazza, Rob Ventura, all the stars, right? They're all staying at this hotel and I'm at the hotel, right? Yeah. I walk in, they tell me I have the presidential suite. You say, why? Why would this schlub sports writer get the presidential suite? Well, the grill there was called the Marshan Grill. He <laughs> thought I was Marshan. So I'm in the presidential suite and I talked to him at the front desk and they told me Al Gore, who was running for president, of course, back then, had stayed in there on his campaign trail in that presidential suite. Two weeks later, they have the Met beat writer uh, for the post. It was a major step down. Piazza, you got to schlep it in. I don't know what suite you're in. I didn't usually stay in suites. Get, okay, let me be honest with you. It's just sometimes you get you get pushed up into your, from your normal room to the presidential seat. They thought I was Marshan. I did not steal the phone, though. Uh, thanks to Uncle Marshan. That's great. <laughs> I don't know how it was Marshan. I tried to go back again and get it to work again. Well, next time they were up there on top of it, I was like, I got to stay there every time. I mean, uh, oh, you see my last name? <laughs> I'm Marshan. Give, give me that. Give me the right room. Now it's time for our call of the week. Call of the week. All right. This time we're just doing one call of the week, and it's from the Olympics and it's from the torch lighting. We have Savannah Guthrie, Mike Tirico calling the torch lighting. Jenny Gear is a member of the Uyghur minority. Of course, those are the people from the region in Northwest China that has attracted so much attention in the conversation of human rights and that ethnic minority comments in the United States government, among others, of genocide being committed against the Uyghurs. So a very significant moment here. Like this moment, uh, is quite it's a statement from the Chinese President Xi Jinping to choose an athlete from the Uyghur minority. It is an in your face response to those Western nations, including the U.S., who have called this Chinese treatment of that group genocide and diplomatically boycotted these games. There will be much discussion about this choice. Savannah Guthrie, Mike Tirico, during the biggest time of the opening ceremony, talking about genocide and Olympics in the same sentence. It's not a very good look for the Olympics. And it, to me, that shows that NBC is very, very serious about talking about some of the big issues, some of the big geopolitical issues that I didn't think they were going to touch. Yeah, they've hit them. They've hit some of them. Look, they're only going to go so far. Uh, and you kind of only can do that. I, you know, understanding the situation there in terms of restrictions and what could happen. Uh, it's not good. It's not how we do it in our country, but, um, but they have hit a lot of these uh, subjects. So they, they do, they've had trouble to ratings, but they do get a thumbs up for that. So look, John, next week, post Super Bowl, we'll break the whole Super Bowl down. Look, Al came on, but we'll be honest, if he did a good job, Collinsworth uh, did well, how Goodelli who's producing it, Fred Goodelli is producing it for NBC, the overall package. And then also which I love, we get into 
NFL TV free agency, which starts up after the Super Bowl. And that's my thing. And so we start that up and we'll get into all that talk and we can really concentrate, even though we've been writing about it since June, out to possibly Amazon, Troy Aikman, that stuff will start to uh, come to fruition or at least hopefully uh, shortly after the Super Bowl. So we'll have that to, to dissect as well as we go forward. It's the winter meetings for uh, free, free agent television stars. I love it. Let's get. We, we should have like a special show. Exactly. All right. Listen. Uh, we, we're trying to get people to listen to this one. You know? <laughs> All right, John. Looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. See you. Uh, see you in a few days. Uh, thank you for everybody for listening.